Welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we'll talk about the clash of civilizations 2.0 and what is behind Macron's refusal to support Israel. Our guest for this show is Rupmati Kandakar, geopolitical analyst who joins us from India. Welcome to the show, Rupmati. Aloha, Jay. Thank you for having me on your show. And it's always my pleasure. Same here. And so we're gonna we're gonna talk today about um, you know what is the clash of civilization, and how has it changed? What is the dynamic these days? We're gonna talk about what Samuel Huntington, the guy who invented the term, what he thinks about the current state of the clash of civilizations. We're gonna talk about how it plays out globally and in Europe, and with regard to Israel and Ukraine, and we're gonna talk about American policy and how it should and can and hopefully will adapt uh, to this clash of civilizations, which we see unfolding before our eyes. So let's begin at the beginning, Rupmati. What is it and how is it changing? Yes, Samuel Huntington was, uh, you know, it was termed so revolutionary that he's talking about this. And uh, the far-sightedness that he had when he spoke about the clash of civilizations. Now, uh, in, a, in a gist, his theory speaks that in, during the Cold War, there were three blocks. The free world, which was led by the United States, uh, the communist bloc, which was led by the USSR, and the non-aligned bloc, which was led, led by India, Yugoslavia, Egypt, uh, etc., etc. So the patterns of association and conflict in the post-Cold War period, he speaks that they change. It's no longer depending upon uh, the nations are going to divide on cultural lines. So Jay, when you talk about cultural lines, he speaks about them to be civilizational linkages. Now, when we say civilizational linkages, Jay, it is like the fault lines between the world's biggest cultural entities. And in that, he says that the West and Western, uh, West, um, Western Europe and US align together. Uh, the Islamic uh, countries are led by Russia. The Chinese uh, uh, bloc, um, the Hindu, uh, um, Association and the Japanese uh, civilization. So these are the, and then he brings in Latin America and Africa. So this is broadly his uh, categorization of the uh, civilizational fault lines. And he says that the divisions and the conflict will take based on their cultural linkages, the civilizational linkages, uh, development, arms, everything takes a backseat, economics takes a backseat, and uh, the countries will. And he gave the example of Yugoslavia, uh, the balkanization, uh, um, for supporting his argument, Jay. And so he spoke about how uh, these, uh, these countries were um, fighting together, but then they divided based on their identities and their base cultural identities. And so, Jay, we, we, we are actually seeing it play out in the new world order today. What he spoke about in the last millennium is actually happening today. We are having fronts, which are, uh, you know, you have these protest uh, protesters on the streets of uh, every university, of every uh, city that we see, which are supporting the Palestine Muslim cause. And then now you're having uh, uh, banners supporting the Jewish state, the uh, Christian uh, um, uh, name, uh, Jesus, like this, you know. So what is this conflict? This is coming to cultural, religion, all these affinities are coming forth, Jay. And that is where this new world order will progress. And like you have made this point about the diaspora, it will be very, very valid if you can explain it in this uh, context that how they keep their identity strong, even if they are in another country. You know, diaspora is something the Jewish people have seen. I mean, um, years back, decades, centuries back, they were all in Israel or in the Middle mm -hmm. East, uh, other countries mm -hmm. around Israel. And, um, and then they were forced to leave. And they left, uh, they, they went, for example, to the Eastern Europe, to Russia. Um, they went to uh, to Spain, Sephardic Jews went to Spain, North Africa, and so forth, way back when. And it was a diaspora, meaning, you know, that it, 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 it spread. Uh, mm -hmm. Groups had to go and they went, but they retained their cultural, as you say, they retain their cultural identity over the years. But now it's different. 
now you can have a diaspora and retain your cultural identity so much more easily. Um, you know, the Jews back when, you know, had their, they had their religious ceremonies, uh, their holidays, their prayers. Um, they had lots of things that bind them together. And even if you looked, say, 100 years ago, you'd find that they, they all spoke Hebrew in the synagogues everywhere in the world. They all followed the holidays and the customs um, all over the world. And that was because it was such a strong religion that they could they could do that. They hadn't forgotten. But these days, the diaspora brought current, um, say, for a country like uh, in the Middle East, um, say, for all those Middle East and North African countries um, that are leaving their their home base and coming across the Mediterranean into uh, you know Europe, um, they retain their culture too, and they can do it so easily. They can do it by looking at um, you know TV. Uh, in in Germany, eighty percent of the uh, Turkish people who live in Germany watch Turkish TV because it's beamed mm. into Turkey, and and that is so with a, a, a great number of the countries in the Middle East and North Africa, and and then there's of course telephones, um, and there's Zoom, if you will, um, and they can communicate with each other so easily and retain the cultural connection. So when we talk about a clash of civilizations, and when we identify civilizations as cultural, which, which is exactly what Samuel Huntington does, because he recognizes the change, just as he recognizes we're not in the old liberal world order anymore, we're in a new world order, which may not be so liberal, and it is defined mm -hmm. by culture. These civilizations are cultural, and they, they are present as, as far as modern telecommunications can go. And so you can have a clash um, between the country, the, the home country, if you will, the mother country in the Middle East or North Africa, um, and a huge population in Europe, all migrants uh, who have immigrated to you know, Europe, and they are in touch with their culture. And if they want to express themselves, if they want to engage in a clash, no problem, because they're in touch with their, their home country. And that's the change. That's the modern view of it by Samuel Huntington himself. Oh, right, Jay. Now, increasingly, nation states, uh, the na uh, it's always that nation states act in their national interest. Now, the people of the nation are acting in their cultural interest. That has become the difference, Jay. And uh, uh, like you explained it, how the immigrants now, uh, just a couple of weeks back or in the last week, 17 countries have passed laws uh, led by Italy, uh, Austria, to deport uh, the migrants, the Muslim migrants. They have uh, categorically said the Muslim migrants who have uh, who are waiting for, uh, who are illegal immigrants back to the country because they have liability on the society. And Jay, increasingly we see on, uh, on our screens and our media that these uh, uh, class, uh, clans of people who settle down in a Western country, after they become uh, a majority in number, they call for Sharia law. So that disturbs the Western uh, uh, lifestyle or Western culture, like you can say, in a, uh, in a place. And we have spoken it, about it time and again, that there's only one religion that has got a political ideology and it knows how to dominate when it comes in majority till it is not in majority and they are mind they lie dormant they play the peaceful card once they feel that they are a majority they will act and that's the same thing that happened in the israel conflict eh? uh, they have kept quiet till they were a minority when they became a majority they started uh, you know uh, creating havoc and creating havoc and destroying peace is their only way to achieve their goals they never have these political movements or they don't have uh, um, ideologies that they follow. It is just violence. So that becomes a problem in, uh, in assimilating in Western culture. And Jay, for, for the clash of civilizations to happen, there has to be a clash of these ideologies. There has to be a clash in the difference of um, uh, opinion. Now the Western culture, like we call it, what is it? It is rule of law. It is uh, your uh, freedom of individuals. 
it is a uh, difference between the uh, state and the religion all these things are so well defined we have constitutions we have everything we don't follow theocracy blindly correct and when you follow a, a, a theocratic book which is written 1300 years ago and you um, what you say you wanted to dominate your neighbor also that creates a problem that creates a tension which is um you cannot really it's inevitable that there's going to be a clash so <laughs> they are going to come uh, after you if you don't follow their religion that is intolerance intolerance is the time that they come in you know you're right uh, the fertility rate is huge uh, for for example uh, muslim families uh, way higher than um you know local european families they have lots of kids and they've been having lots of kids for as long as they've been there and uh, and with the specific notion that, as you said, uh, when you have lots of kids um, and they stay in these countries, they will they will be a political force. They will be mm -hmm. voters. They will be a larger part of the electorate, and they will you know make demands. They will have expectations, political expectations, which is disturbing to a lot of these uh, people who have lived in in Europe before. Um, mm -hmm. And so that is um, that is a problem, and that's one of the reasons for the backlash in Europe. However, it is relentless; it is inexorable, um, and it's really hard to say that if if you say you're not going to allow any more migrants in, because this is you know too disruptive for your society, um, too costly, mm -hmm. if you will, to your society, you still have huge numbers of migrants who live in those countries. And the question is whether, and I, you, you you kind of touched on this, whether those groups um, have already achieved political power. And the answer seems to be yes, not necessarily because they vote, but because they are there, because they make their demands, they make protests, um, they have an effect on public opinion. Uh, and the media covers covers their, you know, their commentaries. And so I think what we have is a shift by virtue of the very process you're describing in Europe, in a number of mm -hmm. countries. Now, the question I would like to ask you about that is this. If I, if I look and I see that after October 7th, several mm -hmm. countries, such as Italy, Japan, Spain, Canada, the Netherlands and Belgium have ceased the sale of weapons to Israel. And we know most recently um, that Macron in France is uh, advocating for as many countries in Europe as possible to cease uh, the sale of weapons to Israel. What's ironic is that France doesn't sell weapons to Israel. France is, is okay. really a bystander about that. But that's what he's advocating. So there's a number of countries in Europe who really don't support Israel. Um, it's being debated in, in Britain, um, and it's obviously being debated in the U.S. But so far, the U.S. and Germany are the major suppliers of Israel's weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's important to notice. And my question to you is, what is the connection, Rupmati? What is the connection between you know the number of immigrants and their public statements, their protests, their political demands, and and what what happened in these countries, in Italy, uh, Spain, uh, France, Netherlands, Belgium, uh, in Europe, and to some extent you know uh, in in Britain. Um, to to turn them away from Israel, is it because of this clash of civilization? Uh, is it because of the difference in culture? Is it a a political phenomenon, um, or is it a moral issue that is supported by you know the historic citizens of those countries? Jay. First, let's condemn Macron's stance on uh, the embargo on. Uh, Israel. Uh, I mean, what did he want? Does he want Israel? If Israel did not have the Iron Dome, it would have been destroyed. If it's not protecting its own citizens, it will destroy. Uh, he's, as a world leader, as one of the country leading uh, leaders of Europe, uh, he has to take a stand for the right and wrong. 
And uh, Jay, when we know who is the enemy and the lines are very well defined, you can fight a battle well. But when you have an enemy within your lines, within your civilizational lines, there lies a blur uh, in what we can counter. Now, Israel, while fighting on the seven fronts, has to also take care of diplomatic efforts to, um, you know, woo these countries or uh, answer back to these countries. So that is an extra burden on Israel. And uh, that um, he made it very categorically clear, Netanyahu, that whether these people want or don't want, Israel has the uh, is uh, capable enough to defend itself. And uh, it was like a, uh, what do you say? It was like a uh, counter on uh, Macron's uh, initiative. He did not need to do this. There was absolutely no need to do this. And Jay, about the voting, uh, Macron thinks he can please the already uh, heavily Muslim uh, population that France has got. Uh, so this is like swinging the voters towards him after we see the civil disobedience movements in France. You see cow dung being uh, splashed on uh, government buildings. There is no, uh, there's no discipline left in uh, France. Was Is France still the same like we used to see it a few years back? No, it's destroyed, completely destroyed. Uh, and Jay, one, one nice uh, example is the uh, election of M Mayor Sadiq in London. While the native population was in pubs and too lazy enough to come out and vote, the immigrant migrant population has gone out and voted him for a historic third term. So uh, you see, uh, they, they, they unite and we lack this unity. So you can't fit. I've told you, Islam is conquered by the sword. Christianity has spread through preaching. Uh, Jews have tried to defend their own land. Uh, Hinduism has existed since 5,000 years, but within themselves. Nobody has gone out and killed to conquer. So this is a, this is a chaotic religion, and it is creating chaos in different, different ways. Now, when Macron gives this um, uh, statement on a high horse, he's talking of Israel to... Uh, Yet doomed, what does he mean? It is, it is condemned, uh, to be condemned in the highest uh, uh, words, Jay, because I think uh, he should have some responsibility when he talks like this. And the leaders who support him, like Canada, Italy, they should take a stance while thinking, not follow the uh, sheep, sheep, uh, sheep walk. It is like they just followed him. They don't know what they're doing. And like you said, France does not supply weapons to Israel that they should take a stand on calling for an arms embargo on Israel. Uh, absolutely politically driven for water, water, water peel. France has a pretty spotty history about anti-Semitism, you know. So does mm. Spain, by the way. Spain's the only country that I know that, you know, actually took his, took his argument, accepted his argument, and went along with him over the last week or two. What troubles me is that Spain, of course, had the Inquisition back in the 15th century. Um, and they, you know, they did terrible things to the Jews. And I don't know how much of that is left in Spanish culture. Uh, during World War II, uh, France was, was was really tough on the Jews. Um, and you remember the movie Vendôme? Uh, it, it was how they rounded up all the Jews in Paris and sent them packing with the Nazis into Germany to go to camps and be killed. Um, the French have a very spotty history on anti-Semitism, even now, today. Uh, a lot of Jews have left mm -hmm. France because they are mm, concerned about this continuing anti-Semitism. So, the, you know, the question I put to you is, um, you know, this anti-Israel notion in, in France, for example, and to some extent in Spain mm -hmm. uh, and other countries in Europe, you know, countries that, that never really stopped being anti-Semitic. I think Germany is not anti-Semitic these days. Um, but what, what we have here is, uh, is a connection or a, a potential connection between this um, clash of civilizations, this clash of cultures, uh, these protests against Israel, and the possibility that they're motivated, at least in part, by old-fashioned anti-Semitism. Your thoughts? Jay, you know, uh, I'll tell you a little anecdote. Like, we used to have these conferences on the Holocaust and everything, and there used to be arguments that there was no Holocaust. I used to wonder why these people talk like this. Why can why are they so blurry in the head that they deny the Holocaust? Today, we are seeing a live 
vision of how they deny the terrorist attack on Israel. It's happening in front of our eyes that they are missiles, ballistic missiles, not simple missiles, ballistic missiles being showered on the 10 million population of Israel. But nobody gives a, a care about how that country can defend itself, how it's trying to fight since one year. Can France go through a three-day war or a seven-day war today? How many um, uh, human rights people will come in? How many women rights people will come? There were live videos of these women of Israel. There were live videos of these soldiers in Israel. Uh, last week, uh, the attack on the Israeli uh, IDF camp. So uh, what, what, what proof do they want? They could deny the Holocaust. They will deny this day in and out, day out. So there comes a point that your mindset becomes come what may and let them say what they want to. Your right to self-defense, your right to exist is uh, just based on survival. And this, this becomes sheer uh, rhetoric which should fall on deaf ears. Because they are, they are blatant and shameless enough to... When, you, when, when I read about that arms embargo, I was literally shocked and I was the political... Um, uh, what do you say? His fault in his political ideology of Macron. I used to think, okay, he is naive or he's not such a vocal person, but he gave such a vocal statement about an arms and uh, who's he trying to please? He's trying to appease a community, whether if you cut your head off also and give it at their feet, they will not get a peace. They will keep their aim and their alignment in their eye eyesight. They will not let go of their aim to conquer and to dominate. Whatever appeasement Macron wants to do, it's going to not be effective at all. I was going to ask you that very question. Let's <laughs> assume for a moment, you know, that he's doing it for political purposes. You know, not because he believes in it. And certainly a lot of people in France are disagreeing with him, giving him pushback on this. Um, this is an interesting dynamic. Um, but he's doing it for political purposes. And that means there is a substantial constituency of people, voters, I suppose, in France, who don't like Israel, who don't, you know, yes. they, they don't want to condemn Hamas. They don't want to condemn Hezbollah. They don't want to condemn Iran for all the violence. No, Israel. Uh, and as you say, you know, they, they deny the Holocaust as well. Uh, too bad that Israel has not been able to change their minds with, um, you know, its own news and counter propaganda, but that's the way things are. And so I, I think that maybe Macron is doing this for political purposes to, as you suggest, to satisfy that group and put himself in better political odor uh, among his constituents. And I also agree with you, it isn't going to help. It isn't going to help at all. It's a fool's move. Because in fact, uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, she's... You know, mm -hmm. when you scratch the surface, you find she's an anti-Semite. She's a pro-Putin. Uh, yeah. um, and she's, you know, she's <clears throat> an extreme right wing. She's perfect, um, you know, to be against Israel. So what exactly is Macron achieving by all this? Not only in France, but any, and to anyone who listens to him. Uh, it's really destructive. And if if I lived in France, I would wonder whether France was falling off the side. Appeasement politics, Jay, it doesn't work in the long term at all. You are appeasing a community which only thinks about self-dominance. They will never ever... I used to... I wanted to use the word naive for Macron, but he is a seasoned politician. He has done this with some thought. And I, I, I hope, you know, uh, he learns to see that it is absolutely futile to say such things. And you understand what kind of a crooked person he is when he talks about an arms embargo the day after or a couple of days after you see ballistic missiles fall on a country. If that country did not have an iron dome, all its citizens would have been uh, finished. What else do you want? If that country defended itself, you applaud the country or you keep your, uh, uh, you don't talk anything, but you don't go and say, stop arms. What do you mean you want it to? Uh, it clearly means that you want the country to be destroyed. And uh, Jay, believe me, are they going to let him in the, in the OIC, uh, Organization of Islamic Countries? Is France going to be allowed inside? No, nobody is going to give anything to him. And he's going to continue on this path. And there's something known as morality. 
whether it's in your personal life, whether it's in your politics, whether it's in uh, any which way. You have to have a moral stand and you have to say what is wrong and you have to say what is right. When you lack this, Noje, the ideological and the civilizational clash becomes more uh, eminent, dominant, and also, you know, uh, it's inevitable. Well, now we Absolutely. should talk about the U.S., um, Rumani, yeah. we should we should shift our focus to the U.S. I mean, Biden recently said that um, you know unless uh, <clears throat> Israel uh, provides more humanitarian aid to the Palestinians in Gaza, he was going to cut them off. Everybody is threatening Israel about this, and it's obvious that they're being bombarded from all sides. And nobody has stopped Iran from you know using and arming and supporting the proxies and. And um, you know you have to you have to applaud Israel for going into Lebanon and and trying to recover its uh, you know its 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 territory in the north. So I guess my my question to you is um, what is what is going on here? Uh, we have an election, you know. This is this is a, a kind of you know a strange election. May I say that? I'll go on record. It's a strange. I don't know exactly what 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 um, you know Trump would do. I don't know what the Democrats would do. I don't know what Biden or Kamala Harris would do. Are they are they going to support Israel or push Israel into a two state solution? I'm really not sure what they're going to do. And and this this um, this this action by Macron really stirs the pot. It stirs the pot for the U.S. So first, I would like to ask you, why is the U.S. not supporting Israel to the fullest extent? Um, to defend. He sent 100 troops in. Gee whiz, 100. I, uh, that's not a lot. And then he sent some defensive, uh, you know, uh, equipment. And that's probably minimal if 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 you measure it by having 100 people to run it. It's not, not a lot. Um, so the question is, are, are we ready to lose Israel? Is that what's happening in this country? Remember, you know, that one of the states, the swing states, is I think it's Wisconsin. It has a very large Muslim population. Um, and he's afraid of losing it. Maybe that's why he's coming down against Israel on that point. I I don't I don't know, but I think it feeds into the election, doesn't it? It does, Jay. But I I hope and fingers crossed that off the record, it's uh, far more health than what is uh, uh, given out. And uh, Jay, uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, let's go. I'll just bring back this clash of civilizations again. Samuel Huntington gave two directions to the U.S. to continue in this new world order. It said that first is uh, reduce your migration, uh, or you know, vet your migration uh, more systematically, and second is align with Western Europe. So these were the two uh, uh, directions that uh, Samuel Huntington gave the U.S. And Jay, politics today is like strange, like you really say. But uh, um, I, U.S. is a very, very strong ally of Israel, and uh, Israel's existence is not only of uh, vital importance; it's of mutual benefit to the U.S. We have a vantage point in the Middle East. We have a strong ally in the Middle East who can support us. And Jay, uh, the the camaraderie now in uh, the Middle East has foc is focusing more on um, economics. So we don't have Saudi Arabia coming into this conflict. And the U.S. has played such a big role in bringing out Saudi Arabia from this conflict. So the U.S. has always used these diplomatic channels to help Israel or to reduce if Saudi Arabia also had come into this, uh, it would have been a little more difficult for Israel. So. Um, the U.S. will never ever leave Israel. Israel is as much as a part, you can call it the latest state of uh, the U.S. It doesn't go far from that. Just the uh, demographic uh, distance is there. Otherwise, nothing, nothing, nothing. Well, if you, if you were the Secretary of State, I know what you would do. <laughs> <laughs> Last week on our Keeping the World Company program, we had uh -huh. what amounted to a debate on uh -huh. whether... Um, NATO is still a reliable organization for mm -hmm. Europe and, for that matter, for the U.S. And um, mm -hmm. some people on the show thought that it was reliable, um, led by Germany, that it, it was uh, always going to support Ukraine. 
Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether we just, I don't think we discussed the Israel question, but, but of course, uh, when you t talk about NATO, they're more interested in Europe proper um, than the Middle East. And so um, we left that one unresolved. But I want to ask you the same question. When you have France and Macron coming out against Israel, as opposed to other countries in Europe not coming out against Israel, supporting Israel, um, and you have these right-wing movements happening in a number of these countries, then you begin wondering whether NATO is reliable, because they don't always agree. Um, there was a, a movie with Glenn Close a few years ago, something about Venus. Um, and uh, the proposition of this movie was that when the Europeans got together to make a pan philharmonic, a, a pan mm. symphony, pan European symphony, they disagreed on everything. At the end of the day, they were not cohesive. They were not collaborative in the movie. And uh, you can say, well, it's just a movie. But I think it, it touched a lot of people because I think that's a, a fundamental question for Europe these days. Will NATO really collaborate? Will NATO really um, you know, be together and reliable under Article 5 of the NATO agreement? Or, or will they have disagreements like in the symphony movie? Um, will they have disagreements like, like over Israel? Uh, it seems to me that uh, although Germany provides a certain amount of leadership, at the end of the day, I'm not confident. How about you? <laughs> they have made a proposal to include Israel into NATO uh, two days back. So let's hope that passes through. And uh, uh, Jay, Europe is a hodgepodge of politics and uh, their politics takes a back seat and debating takes a front seat. And the end result is like uh, other international organizations. It's glitch. Nothing. So they come out, they don't have emphatic uh, decisions made at any level in uh, uh, Europe. And you have these regional leaders, pseudo leaders who try to be, uh, you know, the head of the EU, but they're all falling apart. They have, they are still in the Cold uh, War uh, era where they think that they can be the dominant sailing powers, like you said, <laughs> the Portuguese, the French. It's over now. You are in a, you are a sovereign democratic state confined to your population and to your uh, area. It's not the, the world doesn't, the sun doesn't set on the British Empire. That is long for gone days. Now you have to think about new politics. You have to think about decision making in your own limitations. And that's where Europe falls short, Jay. The countries are still thinking <laughs> they're going to set sail and conquer the Americas. Again, so it doesn't happen that way. So <laughs> Samuel Huntington, and talked about um, you know the 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 change the dynamic of the clash of civilizations and he wasn't particularly optimistic. And the only thing the interviewer could get out of him on that was well it's going to be different. The liberal world <laughs> order is is really over and it's going to be different and and these cultural forces will change it and not necessarily for the better. Now what is interesting is that Samuel Huntington who teaches at Harvard. Um, you know, followed a fellow named Francis Fukuyama. And Fukuyama mm -hmm. wrote a book called The End of History. And in that, he imagined a utopia where, you know, everybody agreed on things and you brought the world together, you know, keeping the world company kind of approach to things. And it would be just fine as time went by. We wouldn't have these contentions. We wouldn't have the clash at all. So uh, I'm not sure if, if uh, Huntington wrote in response to Fukuyama or they were running parallel you know, academic courses, but it uh, seems to me I do not accept what Francis Fukuyama said. <laughs> I don't think we're going to a utopia. I rather think the clash will modify and it won't be very pleasant. What do you think? Yeah, Jay, you're right about this, that the clash won't be pleasant because the civilizational lines are getting more and more dominant. And uh, we, have, we have done a program known as End of Globalization. The limitless, the global village, the utopian global village that we spoke about with no borders, no tariffs. We speak about Trump coming into power and slamming uh, tariffs on the countries who have been uh, trying to uh, curb American exports. So you have this first thing is that people are thinking of national boundaries, tariffs, uh, limitations controlling the boundaries. And this happened after the pandemic. 
we have to take care of that that it happened after the pandemic and people started closing in the borders so uh, Jay, um, when you close the borders you were stuck with your own civilization you got you got more coherent with your own civilizational lines you you were worried about your own breath in uh, of your place which are in another place you started remembering your homeland more than what you were in so all these uh, affinities have become more acute uh, after these uh, this during this time phase and these hypothetical situation that Francis Fukuyama and Samuel Huntington have placed say in the last millennium are coming true in this millennium so uh, just see the far-sightedness of these uh, thinkers and we had real international relations uh, thinkers now we don't have we have commentaries but we don't have these revolutionary thinkers who present such a scenario of a world order based on uh, uh, civilizational lines or historical lines. So uh, it is uh, so uh, fascinating to study and to research about this. And when they give directions to countries that what they should do in this world order, that is even more uh, uh, lovely, Jay, because you see they have a comprehensive view of what the world order should be. They treat the countries like uh, people or members or personalities, like I, in other words. So they, they, they actually give character to the country and they give directions uh, for after that. So and all things considered, where does Macron fit in all of this? It seems to me <laughs> that he's a huge negative force when he comes out with an embargo against Israel. Um, and I and I see this as connected. You, can you connect it for me? Connect what Macron is doing with you know the the projection that Samuel Huntington makes. If I was a psychiatrist, <laughs> I would call Macron as an attention seeker. Jay. He is just an attention seeking tactic. He has nothing to do with this conflict, and he has just put himself into the uh, midst of things by calling this. And I mean, uh, I used to think that uh, um, Macron was a leader with, it was a nimble kind of a leader. There was nothing spectacular about him. He was just a kind of a no, uh, uh, what do you say? There was no evolution in him. It was a drab kind of a uh, consistent line in his uh, political career. But then now it's taken such a dip in my mind that uh, I don't think of Macron to, uh, be capable enough of leading any any country, leave alone France, uh, because he's got no uh, um, thinking capacity to blurt out words. Because in diplomatic terms, when you speak one sentence, also it's interpret. It has got uh, repercussions. It's got uh, uh, implications. This this man just stood up and said, "Put an arms embargo on Israel," and the timing is so uh, incorrect. After the ballistic missile of he should have condemned the Iran attack on Israel. He did one word of it, nothing. So this is where they get the power from. They use these international forums. Turkey uses UN to uh, declare that it should be, everybody should use force on Israel, like it's being used less. So uh, you can't call it sarcasm in politics. You can't, they're, they're jesters on the international political stage. He was weak before. That's why he had a call for the snap election. Remember, only a month or two ago, um, everybody yes. wondered whether he lost his mind because that was not a good a strategical move. Um, but now he's a, essentially a short timer. And, and this puts the future of France uh, in great question because the mm -hmm. right wing may very well uh, take over the French legislature um, next mm -hmm. time around. Anyway, well, thank you, Rupmati. It's been great to talk with you. Great to explore these issues uh, at a at a really high level, and I want to continue to do that. We have to watch what's going on, not only in this country. When I say this country, I mean the U.S., but in India, we have to explore in India, and we have to explore in Europe for sure, uh, including Ukraine and and Israel. Thank you so much, Rupmati. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. Thank you so much.